You're listening to episode 236A of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about your mysterious feedback on some of our recent episodes. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. So our first feedback comes from our episode 221 on Shadow People, and it's audio feedback from Jake. Hey, Jimmy and Tom. My name is Jake from the Cutting the Cordian uh, podcast. I wanted to share a shadow person experience that I once had. Many moons ago, I was managing a restaurant in Charlottesville, Virginia, and I had a sous chef named Derek who had dressed in an all-black chef's uniform. He was kind of a soft-spoken type of guy, so he'd walk up to you and he'd just kind of stand there quietly before saying anything. Well, at the end of the night, before I left, I was bending down to put some cash drawers into the safe for the night, and I saw what I thought was a familiar black figure walking right up to me. And as per normal, he just kind of stopped and was quiet. So I thought it was Derek, and I cracked what I thought was a hilarious joke, but no one laughed. So I turned towards the figure, and just as I did, asking, come on, Derek, why didn't you laugh? That was hilarious. He was gone. So, yeah, I went through the entire restaurant. Nobody was there. I was all alone. I've shared the story with a number of people, and it's amazing that everybody always has a similar experience. So thanks for doing the episode. I greatly enjoyed it, and I appreciate all the good work you do, guys. Yeah, interesting experience, and thanks for sharing it. It is amazing. How many people have had similar shadow people experiences? I was very surprised to see how many listeners reported having them once the episode came out. I had thought of shadow people as, as, you know, a a more marginal thing. And then in researching the episode, Art Bell said he got, you know, thousands of email messages. And then when the Mysterious World episode came out, it's like, wow, I had no idea so many people would report these. Uh, Someone on YouTube even made a, a, a crack that was like, something to the effect of welcome to Jimmy Aiken's mysterious world where everyone has a shadow person experience, <laughs> but it wasn't literally true, but it was very impressive. Yes. Uh, our next feedback comes from Todd, Todd, it, sorry, Thomas. Thomas, Thomas, sorry, Thomas. And uh, uh, it's also audio feedback. Hey, Jimmy and Dom, this is Thomas Salerno. I was so pleased that you decided to devote an episode to shadow people recently because it's actually a phenomenon that I have some personal experience with. At least once or twice a year, I have extensive of sleep paralysis in which I perceive there to be a shadow person or a shadow creature in the bedroom. I'm eventually able to force my body to move or hook out a scream, at which point the shadow vanishes completely and I become fully awake. For a long time, I didn't know what to make of these experiences until in my 20s, I actually saw a TV documentary that explored possible natural explanations for alien abduction reports. And a doctor on this program explained all about the, uh, the phenomenon of sleep paralysis. I was so relieved that I no longer needed to be frightened of these experiences, but could understand them as a natural part of the human dreaming process. I'm glad that you guys could share similar info with the viewers and listeners of the serious world. Great work as always, guys. God bless. Uh, thank you very much, Thomas. Um, as I as I think I mentioned, I've had sleep paralysis at least on rare occasions, not every year, but rarely. And I know what it's like to try to force your body to move, and eventually it gets going, but at first it's hard. Um, glad that in your case, it turns out there's a natural explanation and that it's brought you comfort. I should also mention that Thomas is one of our collaborators here on uh, StarQuest. You can hear him on the Secrets of Movies and TV shows and the Secrets of Middle Earth. And he uh, brings a great perspective to both. So excellent. Our next feedback comes from Greg Winters on Facebook, who wrote, I have seen shadow people over the years. One event I'm pretty sure was an overactive childhood imagination. As an adult, I had one experience that was extremely scary, approximately 20 years ago. It was a shadow, human-sized and shaped figure, at the foot of the bed that can only be described as extremely malevolent and very scary. I was wide awake when it happened. It disappeared, disappeared with my reciting prayers and psalms. Has never happened since then. Glad about that. Great episodes. 
Bonus points for mentioning Slee Stacks. Land of the Lost was one of my favorite shows as a kid. Land of the Lost was one of my favorites, too. Always happy to meet <laughs> a fellow fan of Land of the Lost. <laughs> Gen X uh, g- geriatrics represent. <laughs> Celine McCoy writes on Facebook, a woman with a healing ministry that I used to follow back in the 80s told me that that's our guardian angels wanting to make themselves known to us. Well, I guess that's that's possible. Um, You know, angels don't have to manifest in any particular way, and angels can even be scary. I mean, often one of the first things they say is, don't be afraid. Um, though I think there are multiple other explanations as well, including natural ones like dreams and misperception and paranormal explanations like haunting apparitions of deceased humans and even demons in some cases. Uh, patron Rick Mansfield wrote on Patreon, Jimmy mentioned that a few of these accounts of shadow people involved an observer in another room hearing both sides of a conversation. I don't recall hearing an explanation of those events. Thanks. Well, if an observer is hearing both sides of a conversation and there's no natural explanation, then that would point to this being a paranormal experience, like the ones we covered. Um, The hearing might either be physical or telepathic, in which case it might be overhearing an apparition, you know, which sometimes happens. Chris Buckley uh, writes via email, thanks for the terrific look at shadow people phenomena. Though I had a good handle on how you'd break down the possibilities, I was interested to hear how you'd rank the likelihood of each. I was surprised you didn't dive deeper into one possibility, however. I wonder, was that by design? Specifically, when you touched upon poltergeist activity, you were quick to observe that telekinesis is often the primary cause of it. In keeping with Alois Weisinger's... Alois uh, Weisinger. Elo- Thank you. We need to give you the correct pronunciation. Alois Weisinger's hypothesis in occult phenomena in the light of theology, many, if not most observable paranormal activity has an unconscious human cause through the natural capacities of the soul. When the soul is free to act after the manner of a spirit in a partially body-free state, as in partial sleeping, waking, and dreaming states, Weisinger posits per Aristotle and Aquinas that it can, in fact, see and know things beyond visible sight, move physical objects, communicate verbally, bilocate, and even manifest visibly and tangibly. Especially given the association of shadow people with sleep paralysis and dreaming states where the soul is partially free to the body to act after the manner of a spirit, I would expect that a primary explanation might be that shadow people are like poltergeists, not just a dream, but visible and maybe tangible projections of the viewer's own unconscious mind into the physical world. Did you consider that option and reject it? If so, why? As always, thanks for taking the weird and wondrous seriously. So for folks who may not be aware, uh, Father Alois Weisinger was a Catholic parapsychologist in the early 20th century. Um, I could have gone deeper into the subject of poltergeists and shadow people than I did, But I did say that I could see how the two could go quite well together. And there are cases of shadowy figures that are connected with poltergeists. Sometime I may have Lloyd Auerbach come back on the show to talk about the Black Knight of Petaluma, which was a case he investigated where a woman in Petaluma, California, was causing poltergeist activity subconsciously, and she was also projecting the image of a Black Knight that she realized in hindsight after she saw Star Wars looked a lot like Darth Vader. Um, I also, uh, so such cases do exist where the person is both projecting recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis and they're projecting an image of some kind. Um, I also do plan on devoting an episode to Father Alois Weisinger's uh, uh, views of parapsychology in the future. So we'll be briefing you more about him in another episode. Mary writes via email, Hi, Jimmy and Dom. I just wanted to share two points about the Shadow People episode. One, I thought the idea of Shadow People seemed kind of silly, but then I got into the episode. This one really scared me, and wondering if my subconscious would bring Shadow People into my dreams didn't help. But I'm thankful for Jimmy's level-headed approach to topics, because by the end of it, the rational part of my mind got past the fear. 
Second, there's a song called Shadow People by Dr. Dog that I will never listen to in the same way now. The song isn't even about the phenomenon, but the lyrics fit. Y'all should check it out. And please keep the episodes coming. Just listening week to week has helped me think more rationally. Thank you very much, Mary. And thank you for the song recommendation. The Zinger on Discord writes, I just listened to Jimmy's explanation of sleep paralysis. I have experienced it a couple of times, and the first time was terrifying. The second time was kind of like, oh, I know what's going on, so it wasn't as scary. From what I've heard on the subject, the images can be heavily influenced by culture and used to be called old hag syndrome because when people were afraid of witches, that's what they would see in those cases. In the era of sci-fi, it could also explain some alien abduction cases. I recall seeing aliens when I had sleep paralysis because I was big into Star- Stargate SG-1 at the time I first experienced it. I'm glad that you've been able to get some peace regarding sleep paralysis. And yes, uh, the images that people see during it are often culturally conditioned. Christina T. on Discord wrote, My coworker had a dream catcher made especially for me after she heard that I had sleep paralysis once. Not only was I panicked because I couldn't move or talk, but the suspension bar in my closet also flew and hit me in the head. There was something else in the room with me. Then a few years back, I saw a black face with red eyes floating in my mom's bedroom. I yelled at her and she said she could see it too. We were legit scared and I always have seen shadows pass by, usually in front of the TV, and I've yelled at them to get out of the way, too. I hung the dream catcher on my window. I'm not saying it kept the be- bad away, but I'm too chicken to take it down to find out. Well, dream catchers won't have any power on their own, but they can be a symbol of your determination not to let bad stuff enter your home. And parapsychologists would say that that determination can be a kind of psychic defense that could help keep it out. Even though a dream catcher is not a Christian symbol in terms of its origin and does not have any power of its own, you also could turn it into a kind of enacted prayer, like lighting a candle in a church is is an enacted prayer. Uh, You could ask God to take the dream catcher as a symbol of your faith in him and his ability to protect you. Uh, It sounds like you've had some scary experiences, but they haven't hurt you, and that's important to remember. However frightening people may find them, shadow people rarely, if ever, actually hurt anybody. Ave True to Caesar writes on Discord, I remembered reading a Catholic mystic saying that she was woken up by a shadow person. At first she was afraid as she thought it was evil and so said prayers and stuff, but it didn't go away finally. Finally, she decided to pray with it and it gradually got lighter and lighter until it looked like a person and finally the individual appeared to her in a bright light and went to heaven. Awesome. Glad she was able to help it out. Andres wrote, writes on YouTube, I'm a mental health therapist at a county jail. I've lost count of the number of people who see shadow people. At first, I dismissed it as possible sleep deprivation or hallucinations. But after three years of person after person describing a nearly identical entity, people who I have safely ruled out for schizophrenia, meth intoxication, and sleep deprivation, I've come to the conclusion that there's something there. There could be another explanation for the phenomena, but it certainly is not due to mental illness. I'm also an agnostic atheist, and such entities do not fit into my naturalistic worldview. I do not know what they are, but I can't in good conscience dismiss them, given my background in mental health, and knowing the difference between the typical hallucinations of an individual with schizophrenia compared to these experiences which are shared by individuals all over the spectrum who do not share any common mental health diagnosis. Whatever they are, they're the strongest piece of evidence I've encountered that makes me question my own naturalism. Well, howdy, Andres, and glad you're listening to and enjoying the show. I, too, used to be much more skeptical about paranormal phenomena, you know, because I was raised in the skeptical West. But upon studying the evidence... I've come to realize that there's more in the world than the materialist materialist worldview commonly supposes. And um, if you keep listening to the show, which I hope you will, um, you will be presenting more evidence that also suggests the world is richer than we might suppose. So thanks again and stay in touch. Catherine Carell writes on YouTube, 
My pastor talked to us about the shadow people in church. He never uses fear in his sermons, but he told us of a woman who bought a house locally. Her kids were screaming at night, claiming they saw shadows walking up the stairs and coming into their rooms. She didn't believe them, and it got so bad she was showing up at work late from lack of sleep, and the kids were having serious problems at school from lack of sleep. About six months later, she saw them herself. She knew our pastor could cast out demons. He inquired of her neighbors about the people who lived in the house before her. They said she was a witch. He presumed this witch must have opened a portal of some kind. So in the name of Jesus Christ, he anointed the whole house with oil, every doorway, every window, etc. The family never experienced the shadow people again. Good. Glad they, uh, glad they found a solution. Aaron Bush writes on YouTube, Sometimes I look very forward to settling down in bed on my way to sleep, listening to the newest Jimmy Aiken podcast. A few times I've been underwhelmed by the research and presentation. This episode was one of those times, as was the one on reincarnation, that re relied too heavily on debunking the already debunked and pretty much ignored more substantial research on the topic, such as the University of Virginia's study of children's recollections of having lived before and some of the rather amazing evidence for some such. Jimmy, you're the only one out there I've come across who can maybe fill the empty space left when Art Bell passed. And the best part about that is you can do it with an academic bent that, though different than Art's theater of the mind style, is the perspective a discussion of these topics should have in this somewhat more intelligent era. I know you don't have a phone-in audience or guest experts, but that means you can be truly robust in your research. Informative is entertaining. I would really like to hear you do an episode on the practice of hoodoo, not voodoo, and the use of psalms and biblical passages as magic. i particularly like to hear if and why such a project is or is not contradictory to Catholic values. Howdy, Aaron. I'm glad you enjoyed the show. Sorry this episode wasn't to your liking, but I'm glad that you usually like it. Uh, I've mentioned before that the episodes we did on reincarnation and Bridie Murphy were initial preliminary episodes just to introduce the audience to the concept by talking about the most famous case. Um, we will be doing future episodes on reincarnation that look at much better documented cases, including ones um, like the ones that Ian Stevenson researched at the University of Virginia that you mentioned. Um, hoodoo, as distinct from voodoo, is on the big list of future topics. When it comes to using psalms and other biblical passages as magic, I I need to see you know examples of how they're being used because I can imagine this taking a number of different forms, and it's also going to depend on how you define magic. Um, in some cases, it would amount to at least what I can imagine would amount to a superstitious use of the texts, which would not be morally permissible. You know, thinking that. Um, just by saying them. They have some kind of intrinsic power on their own, apart from reciting them as a prayer and relying on God's power and trusting in God, which would be perfectly fine and not magic at all. Um, anyway, thanks again, and uh, you're very kind to compare me with Art Bell. I enjoyed listening to him too. Uh, Dada Bigfoot on YouTube writes, a lot of evangelical Protestants attribute sleep paralysis to demons. I suffered from severely frequent sleep paralysis and visions of demonic entities, but understood it as a medical condition likely caused by traumatic stress when I was a child mixed with poor sleep hygiene. After all, I was an agnostic at the time. But the strangest thing is that the sleep paralysis persisted even after I got healthy. It only went away when I converted to Catholicism. I don't believe that it was demons I was encountering, Rather, I think that the psychological benefits that came from the joy of being a Christian somehow knocked my brain out of the trauma cycles I had since I was a child and back to a place where I no longer had sleep paralysis. Good for you. I'm glad that you're home and that you found peace and that you no longer suffer from the problem. I, I know what you mean about becoming a Christian, um, changing things. When I... Uh, first became Christian. Now, I didn't have sleep paralysis, but I did have a lot of frustration and um, could be kind of abrasive uh, with other people at the time. It was also partly time of life issues, but I noticed after I became Christian at age 20, uh, 
I, a few weeks later, I'm going, you know, I have had the normal issues that I've had. I was, I was feeling better. I was doing better. So there, there is a psychological benefit that's been borne out in, um, in other studies to, uh, to being a person of faith compared to a person who doesn't presently have faith. Our next group of feedback comes from episode 222, which was a patron's questions episode. First one comes from Heather Comstock on Facebook, who writes, My absolute favorite line in the whole episode was the discussion of centering prayer and Jimmy pointing out that we didn't have to be able to articulate ourselves and that, quote, sometimes we just need snuggle time with Jesus, end quote. And that's true. We don't have to be Thomas Aquinas every single moment. Kathy Morrison Romer on Facebook wrote, Hi, Jimmy, just finished listening to today's podcast. Insightful and fun as always. On the subject of prayers to cast out demons and who may use them, I think the story in the Acts of the Apostles about the Jewish exorcists, Acts 19, 13 to 17 specifically, is the origin of the theory that only certain people can perform the rite. I always look forward to the many, the many thought-provoking subjects you and Dom cover. Have a blessed day. Thank you, Kathy. Um, Acts 19 is a cautionary tale that is part, though not all, of the background as to why only authorized priests, not just priests, but authorized priests, um, are allowed to do full exorcisms today. But in principle, exorcisms can be performed more broadly. Jesus acknowledged in the Gospels that Jewish exorcists had the ability and anybody in an emergency can rely on God and cry out to him, and he can intervene to protect his children, whether it's a formal exorcism or not. Jude Peterson writes on YouTube, I would like to see your reasoning for the assertion that Tobit is just a parable and not a historical account. The book seems to present itself as a true story, so where do you get that idea from? Is that how the Jews understood it? So the book of Tobit ended up not being included in the Jewish canon of Scripture, and we don't really have ancient commentaries on it. Um, and since it's not in, it didn't end up in their canon of Scripture, Jewish people have tended over history not to comment on it that much. However, scholars of all persuasions, whether you're Christian or Jewish or agnostic or whatever you are, have recognized, I mean, the ones who have carefully studied Tobit, have um, recognized that there are elements in the book that look like deliberate clues to the audience to tell the audience that they're reading a non-literal account. An example of that is Tobit lives in the book to, a, he has this fantastically long lifespan, way more than humans naturally live, and he's not like in the distant patriarchal past. He's living in what was then the modern day. And yet he has this fantastically huge lifespan. Um, also in the book, uh, the legendary figure of Ahikar shows up. And it's kind of like if you're reading a book and Paul Bunyan or Sherlock Holmes shows up in it, you know, these are legendary figures. It kind of signals to you that you're, you're not reading a historical account, but something that's meant to be taken in another way. The Afro Sam writes on YouTube, regarding blessings, the way I've heard it explained is that when we say God bless you, what we mean is actually may God bless you, which is a request. But to the point of authority, just as a priest has authority to invoke a blessing over his congregation, a father has the authority to invoke a blessing over his family. According to this line of thought, this would be different from a congregant blessing his priest, which would be a request. Well, you're certainly correct uh, that fathers and priests have roles with respect to their families and congregations that make their blessings especially appropriate. Um, I don't know that they're different in kind, though, uh, in terms of like being a request. A as an interesting matter of English grammar that not many people know today, in English, we have historically used the bare verb form to signal the subjunctive mood. Uh, the subjunctive mood is used to express desires, or it can be. And so when we use the subjunctive mood in the context of a blessing, we are expressing a desire that God bless someone. And so that is an implicit request that we're making of God. We're not talking to God, so it's not an explicit request. We're talking to the person we're blessing. 
um, but it expresses a desire for God to bless that person, and so it's an implicit request of God. And there are two ways that we uh, form the subjunctive or convey the subjunctive in English. The old-fashioned way is to use the bare verb form, just the unmodified verb, as in, God bless you. Um, bless is the bare verb form. It's not modified. It does. It's not blesses or blessing or anything like that. It's just bless, the, the, the bare verb itself. God bless you. The more common modern way of doing this, though, is to add the auxiliary verb may in front of the verb, um, which gives us may God bless you. So we have the may in there, um, and both of them mean exactly the same thing. Grammatically, they're just different ways of conveying the subjunctive mood, and um, so they, they're, they're identical in meaning. One's just more familiar to us today than the other. Uh, incidentally, you hear a lot of the older form of the subjunctive in the Lord's Prayer with the bare verb form rather than the word may. So we say, hallowed be thy name. Be is the bare verb form. We don't, but it means may your, may your name be kept holy. Similarly, thy kingdom come. Come is the bare verb form, but it means may your kingdom come. And then thy will be done. Be is the bare verb form, but it means may your will be done, and so forth. Carolina Fine writes on YouTube, is centering the prayer the same as being quietly in God's presence? Centering prayer. Sorry. <laughs> is centering the prayer is centering prayer the same as being quietly in God's presence? I'm not trying to be difficult, and I'm generally confused on the matter. But my priest, by no, no means a traditionalist, told me to stay away from centering prayer. Well, your priest may just be telling you what he's heard. Um, there is no single uniform version of centering prayer, at least as far as I've been able to determine. It's explained and done differently by different people, and the Vatican has not made any judgment on centering prayer one way or another. So that tells us we need to be cautious here. Um, there's no problem with just being quiet in God's presence, but, you know, people can mess anything up, and I'm sure there are people who've messed up centering prayer. Um, how common that is or how uncommon that is, I don't know. I don't do centering prayer, and I haven't studied it in depth. But just because some people may mess it up, that doesn't mean we can condemn any and all versions of it just based on rumors we've heard. Uh, because some things that are sometimes called centering prayer might be perfectly fine. Um, I know it's easy to try to just decide things based on rumors, but we really need to look closer and consider individual practices and not reflexively condemn them just because of what we've been told. We need to be careful and not just reflexively condemn things. The grumpiest man alive on oh, YouTube. A good principle, apropos <laughs> yep. of that, a good principle is if you're going to condemn something, you want to be able to say why, and more than just this is what I heard, because <laughs> in, in, unless you can name the reason you want to say you shouldn't do this, you don't really have good grounds for saying that you shouldn't do this. Okay, so this next comment is from the grumpiest man alive on YouTube. Cool. <laughs> That's a, quite a distinction. I was under the impression that until a married couple has marital relations, they're allowed to remarry if they separate, under, unlike couples who have had such relations. Is this actually the case? Potentially. So here's the way it works. If two baptized people marry each other and then consummate the marriage, then it cannot be dissolved by anything except death. However, if two baptized people or two unbaptized people or one of both marry and do not consummate, then it is possible in principle for the marriage to be dissolved. However, the circumstances in which the dissolution happens can vary 
So it isn't just automatic upon separation. There can be more that is that is needed in order for the marriage to be dissolved. But it is possible in principle. Doreen McCarthy writes on YouTube, Thank you for your comment on my question regarding climate change. I have real trouble believing all the hype about it, as I'm old enough to remember the population bomb stuff and nuclear winter, etc. Scares of the past. I had my own biases and just wondered what someone with the critical thinking skills of Jimmy has to say about it. I don't think God would give us the gifts of oil, coal, and gas if we weren't supposed to use them, but I do believe we could be better at conservation. Thank you for your insight. Glad that the perspective was helpful, and thank you. The next bit of feedback comes from episode 223 on Spring Hill Jack. And the first comment comes from Paul Pasma on Facebook, who writes, had to check my calendar to make sure it's not April 1st. Ha ha. Well, glad you checked. And no, the Spring Hill Jack episode did not come out on April 1st. We only do April Fool's episodes on April Fool's Day. And even then, sometimes the story we tell is just really weird, but it's absolutely true and not misleading at all, like last year's Ghost Bride episode. Then uh, Michael McFall writes, I had never heard of this character before this episode. Fascinating mystery. I like the idea that it originated on a bet. Seems very Victorian era to me. Thanks for another great episode. Glad you enjoyed it. And I personally find Spring Hill Jack fascinating and have for a long time. Irony Matt on YouTube writes, a possible tangential aspect to this story that occurred to me was if the actions of Jack the Ripper were that of an sp- individual taken with Spring Hill Jack's exploits, but, even, but of an even more deficient morality. Yeah, so Jack the Ripper um, operated about 50 years after the original Spring Hill Jack's exploits. So Spring Hill Jack was in the 1830s, at least orig- the original one was, and then Jack the Ripper was in the 1880s. And there are major differences between what Jack the Ripper did and what spring Jack did. Uh, Jack the Ripper was, and by the way, the word Jack appears in both of their names just because it was, it's a version of the name John, which is the most common English name for a man. And so in British English, a Jack just means a man. So like a steeple Jack is, you know, a guy who works with steeples or a, uh, Jack in the box, that's the man in the box. Um, Jack just means man. So um, that's all the significance there is to that. But Jack the Ripper was a violent psychopath of a particularly horrific kind. Whereas spring Jack was just a prankster who scared people but didn't actually hurt anybody. Um, given the differences, I don't know that we have evidence of a connection between the two, but We will have a future episode on Jack the Ripper. Excellent. Our next feedback will be on our episodes 224 and 225 on Edgar Cayce. And the first feedback is some audio from Eric. Hi, Jimmy. This is Eric from Shrewsbury, Massachusetts. I thought it curious that you neglected to address the issue of what you concluded the source was of Edgar Cayce's knowledge of cures for the diagnoses he made. I was immediately reminded, yes, I know what you're going to say, a first Enoch chapter 8's portrayal of demons teaching men various skills, including root cuttings, verse 3, which I assume is a reference to herbalist cures. None of the source theories you evaluated except for the demon hypothesis, in my opinion, adequately account for where Casey got his healing knowledge. Moreover, speaking in unknown languages is a known characteristic of demonic influence or possession. You yourself did not think he could have known this through natural means. If you are not ready to admit the demonic influence theory, where did the cures come from And how did Casey come to be fluent in an obscure Italian dialect? So I didn't neglect discussing the source of Edgar Casey's alleged knowledge of medical conditions. I covered several sources, including natural ones, like the alternative health practitioners he hung out with, and book reading that he did. I also covered paranormal sources, like the alleged Akashic Record, 
departed human spirits and demons. Uh, second, who says I'm not willing to admit the demonic influence theory? I didn't say anything of the kind. I just said I don't have good evidence that this was the case. I did not dismiss the demonic hypothesis. I said it could not be ruled out. I just didn't see strong evidence for it. Um, for the most problematic things he said, well, we know that he was in contact with people who really wanted to hear those things. And he may have been consciously or unconsciously telling them what they wanted to hear, including picking up on it telepathically. Um, since we know that he was in contact with such people and we don't know that he was in contact with demons, those people are the logical starting point for explaining his most problematic claims. We need additional evidence if we want to claim, rather than just speculate, that he got that information from demons. Third, I'm, I'm not sure what you're referring to when you say you know what I'm going to say when you refer to the account in First Enoch. Um, however, if you thought that I was going to say that First Enoch is not a reliable, literal account of events in primeval history, then you'd be right. At best, First Enoch it may be taken in a way that is non-literal to the extent it's accurate at all. Um, I think it's particularly dubious that it is literally true that demons taught mankind about medicine. The vast bulk of medical knowledge we have was obtained by human effort. And since in the ancient world, medicine and magic were tied up together, it's easy for me to see how some ancient Hebrews falsely imagined that medical knowledge came from demons because of the pagan elements associated with it. In any event, we can discuss First Enoch in a future episode. Regarding your two questions, uh, first, how did Edgar Casey get knowledge of appropriate medical, medical treatments for people? I don't know that Edgar Casey had paranormal treatment recommendation abilities at all. Um, his success in this area is not so high that it was clearly paranormal. It may have been due to natural causes and random chance. Regarding getting medical knowledge from demons, well, okay, yes, demons have medical knowledge, or I assume they do. Um, but it isn't a valid inference to say demons have medical knowledge, therefore his medical knowledge must have come from demons. I mean, demons also have knowledge of auto mechanics, but that doesn't mean if someone psychically gains knowledge of car repair that it must have come from demons. Um, recommending medical treatments is not a classic sign of possession. Uh, we don't see it in the Bible, and we don't see it in history. and a sketchy verse from something like First Enoch is entirely too slender a read to base a sound argument on. Uh, there are other sources of medical knowledge, both natural and paranormal, that he could have gotten the information from, including the Akashic Record, and telepath if, if that exists, and telepathic contact with the subconscious of people who do have that medical knowledge. For your second question, uh, how was Edgar Casey briefly fluent in a dialect of Italian? Um, speaking other languages is a known characteristic of demonic influence, but that's not to be overestimated. It is not something we see reported in Scripture. It only shows up in later history, and as far as I'm aware, demons aren't necessarily language show-offs. Um, it's possible that in many cases, priests may simply test the demon by speaking Latin to it and seeing if it's able to respond in kind when they know that the host does not speak Latin. Um, that's not the same thing as demons being eager to show off their language skills, you know, particularly in a setting where the demon hasn't yet been detected. You know, if it's trying to be sneaky, um, it's probably not going to be going, hey, look at all the languages I can speak that my human host doesn't know anything about, because that would kind of blow its cover and tell you there's a demon here we need to deal with. Um, and so, um, so that's one thing to consider. Another thing to consider is that um, demons are not the only cause of speaking an unknown language, which is a phenomenon known either as xenoglossy or glossolalia. 
both whatever whatever you call it xenoglossy and glossolalia are also a gift of the holy spirit so xenoglossy can indicate diametrically opposite things which reveals that you can't use the inference demons sometimes speak other languages therefore if someone speaks another language they must have a demon that would be a logical fallacy known as affirming the consequent it's fallacious to say well san diego is in california therefore anyone who lives in california lives in san diego and it's also fallacious to assert d demonic influence just because a language is being spoken it can be an indicator but not more than that because um it, speaking other languages can also be caused by other things i mean if we know that foreign languages can be paranormally produced by demons and by the holy spirit there are potentially other sources as well and i can think of multiple ones including the alleged akashic record which is supposed to contain a history of the world and therefore of human languages however in this case there is a much simpler source paranormally another paranormal source assuming that psychic functioning exists there would be another more obvious paranormal source for where she where he would get this knowledge of this dialect telepathy the reading was being given for a woman in italy and so if this was a paranormal event the obvious source of the information for knowledge of her dialect would be the woman he was giving the reading for you know he's making contact with her already psychologically to do the reading he can just pull up the data from her subconscious that he needs to communicate that information to her. So assuming he had uh, genuine psychic abilities, we have evidence that Edgar Casey was telepathically drawing on the knowledge of his clients, you know, uh, telling them what they wanted to hear about Atlantis or whatever. Um, we know that he had contact with this woman. Therefore, she would be the obvious source of the information he relied upon in giving the reading for her. And that's just the most obvious non-demonic source that the information could have come from. So in conclusion, I understand how tempting it can be to attribute everything we don't understand to demons, but I'm not going to attribute things to demons without good evidence. Casey may have gained information from demons, but I don't have good evidence of that. Our next feedback comes from Anonymous, and it's audio feedback. Well, hello, Jimmy. Hope you're doing well. Um, comment, question regarding Edgar Casey. Did any of the original uh, remote viewers ever comment on Edgar Casey? Thank you. I'm sure that I've seen some of the original Stargate viewers comment on Edgar Casey, but my memories of it are fuzzy, and I don't remember what was said. I'm sure they noted similarities between the kinds of uh, readings that he was giving, which sometimes uh, seemed to incorporate elements that were very much like modern remote viewing, but also went beyond modern remote viewing. Um, so those are, you know, no, those are well known in the paranormal community. In fact, um, in the episodes on Edgar Casey, we played some clips from uh, Stephen Schwartz who um, was not only famous for having read all of the Edgar Casey readings and done a study of them, he also was involved in, um, in remote viewing experiments. And so there's right there a connection to the remote viewing community. Ann Duffy Kuhlman on Facebook writes, I grew up playing the pit game, still have it, and passed the fun on to my kids. Never knew this about the game, though. Love this episode. Uh, thanks for letting us know that. Yeah, I had not really heard of Pitt, um, but he designed it and glad that you find it enjoying. BZ Javier on Facebook writes, to be honest, I was expecting to hear more about his claims regarding the future, Egypt, Atlantis, Jesus, etc. Yeah, um, many people today are very interested in those topics, but they're actually a comparatively small part of what Edgar Casey did and I wanted to give people a, you know a rounded picture of of what he did rather than just focusing you know 
primarily on the hot spots that attract the attention but aren't really representative of his work. Paul DeHunt on Facebook writes, very interesting episodes. Thanks. Has anyone looked at the medical advice he gave and objectively analyzed it for plausibility using today's standards? Many of the treatments included in the show contained ingredients that we know today do nothing. As Jimmy said, the placebo effect is real, so perhaps that's all that was going on. Combined with all his other misses, my inclination is to say, nah, another snake oil salesman, even if he was sincere. There may have been such studies done, but I'm afraid I don't know of any more recent studies than the ones I quoted in the show. Les wrote on our Discord, the most mysterious items with Edgar Casey would be the obscure item at the pharmacy and the Italian dialect. I wonder about a pharmacy, but then this was before 1946, that has unknown, out-of-date items on a shelf. Yeah, how about that? <laughs> Mr. Gower from The Tone of a Life. Yeah. <laughs> Is there independent verification of that and the Italian translation? They could have just made up those two stories. As far as other psychic readings, the segment of the population that would write to him are already predisposed to believe a placebo will cure them. Well, um, so Stefan Schwartz, who we heard from in that episode, uh, has been through the entire Edgar Casey archive and found those readings there. Um, they're apparently still uh, uh, they're they're available to uh, members uh, today, and they're still in the archive, so they're still available for research. I'm not aware of anyone having done document authentication on them. Um, and even then, they could have been faked at the time. But I'm not aware of any evidence that would suggest that. Parks Mason wrote in via email, Thanks so much for delving into Edgar Casey and making it a two-parter. My mom's side is from Hopkinsville, and he's something of a local celebrity there. My grandfather used to tell me about the Sleeping Prophet when I was younger, but I never really knew much about him. Many years later, I learned that he's actually a distant cousin of ours. He's buried in the same cemetery as my great-grandparents and many other family. His grave has become a, a, niche tourist, a niche tourist attraction. Many thanks. Well, thank you very much. And that's very interesting to know. And just to let you know for the future, we will be going back to Hopkinsville, uh, Kentucky, because that's the site of a very, very famous UFO alien encounter that we will be talking about, the Hopkinsville Goblins. Lisa Noble writes on YouTube, as someone who was into New Age stuff, I read a lot about Edgar Casey. I concluded that his reading the Bible every year was an important part of why he had such abilities. So I did that. And after just my, just my first cover to cover reading of the Bible, I knew I had to return to the Catholic Church. I always thought that Edgar Casey could have become a great saint if he had entered the church. Instead, he fell into the trap of the parlor games and deceptions of the evil one. Well, certainly he uh, he did teach things, uh, especially later in life, that were contrary to the Christian faith. Fortunately, those are tied up with other readings that are demonstrably false. So it's in the area of where he was telling people what they really wanted to hear, whether he knew that's what he was doing or not. And the accuracy of, or I should say the inaccuracy rate, of those readings is very clear. They are not reliable. Uh, Dutchman's Mind wrote on YouTube, so if Casey's talent was similar to remote viewing, when asked about past lives, he might have viewed the overlay of what the client wanted to hear rather than a past life that didn't exist? Yeah, um, telepathic overlay and unintentionally telling the client what they want to hear are real possibilities. If psychic functioning exists, he could have been picking up on, you know, a person's subconscious desire about what they would like to hear about their past lives and then just tell them that. Our next feedback comes from our oh, bonus. I, yep. I, sh I, should, I, I should mention, we'll talk about this more in the future, but this is a known phenomenon. Um, in, and it's not just with remote viewing, it's with other things as well. Um, there have been cases. So the earliest one I'm aware of was a, a, a 19th century researcher who was investigating mediums. And he, and this happened, uh, I'll only name one example, I'm aware of a couple, but he invented an imaginary niece and thought up the details of her life and didn't tell anybody. 
And then he goes to the medium and says, I want you to tell me, I want you to contact my niece. And the niece, uh, the medium tunes in to the fake niece and accurately tells him the details that he had invented about the fake niece. And, um, you know, that were not written down, had never been told to anybody, but she tells him what he had imagined about his fake niece. And so that would be an example when the target is not real. The subconscious may switch to looking for something else for information about it, and it picks up, oh, here's somebody who who thinks they have information about it. Let's tell them that. And the mm. same thing is reported in remote viewing circles, where if you assign a person an imaginary target, like a um, British remote viewer I know named Daz Smith did an experiment where he invented a, uh, a UFO landing on his lawn and then tasked remote viewers with viewing this event. And of course, they're totally blind to it. You know, they, all they get is a target number. They just please view the following target. And they have no idea about what it is. And they come back describing a UFO landing. And so this kind of telepathic overlay problem is reported in the literature. And yes, it could be responsible for a lot of what Andrew Casey claimed. Our next feedback is from our bonus episode number 224A on God's Wife. And the Zinger on Discord writes, I had not heard of this particular thing before the episode today, but it sounded like just a rehash of the whole Jesus and Mary Magdalene were married thing from 10 to 15 years ago. Yeah, to a significant degree, that's all it is. It, I mean, it, the details are different, but it feeds off the same kind of transgressive emotions that the Jesus and Mary Magdalene were married thing did. Savannah wrote via email. Hello to you both. I enjoy the show and would like to offer a topic, Lilith. I'm being asked about Adam's first wife and why the Bible got rid of her. Thank you for your insight. Okay, so um, the idea that Lilith was Adam's first wife is a post-biblical idea. Uh, it apparently arose in Jewish circles in the Middle Ages, and so it wouldn't be in the Bible because the Bible was already written. The Bible did not get rid of Lilith as Adam's first wife. And um, we may have a future episode devoted to Lilith, so stay tuned. Momo writes on YouTube, first, you have to prove God real before you assume he had a wife. Well, proving God is real can be done in a variety of ways, so that doesn't eliminate the question. Our next feedback comes from episode 226, which was a weird questions episode. Uh, first comment comes from Heather Comstock on Facebook. I had to comment. The capital of Maryland is Annapolis, not Baltimore. While Maryland was initially founded as a haven for Catholics during England's glorious revolution, Puritans who had been welcomed in Maryland after being expelled from Virginia revolted against the proprietary government in Maryland and eventually passed laws overturning religious toleration and outlawing the celebration of mass and catechesis. Eventually, St. Mary's was replaced by Annapolis as the state's capital. Many Catholic children were sent out of the country for Catholic education, including John Carroll, the first American Catholic bishop, and his cousin, Charles Carroll of Carrollton, the only Catholic signer of the Declaration of Independence. At the time of the American Revolution, he was Maryland's richest person, but was in fact disenfranchised due to his religion. Fun fact, he was also an investor in America's first railroad, the Baltimore and Ohio. Thanks for the information, Heather. And finally, from Gav Asia Robinson on YouTube, the Bible doesn't say that Adam and Eve were homo sapiens. Correct. Um, it doesn't. Uh, the Bible does not give us a way to map what you could call biblical or theological man onto the different members of the modern scientific genus homo. And so as a result, all such mappings or identifications onto particular subspecies must remain speculative. 
Excellent. And that'll do it for this time. Thank you all once again for your feedback. We love getting your feedback. And you can send in your own mysterious feedback on any of the topics we cover. You can do so by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page by sending us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com. Including emailing audio or video in addition to text. Yes, please do. And sending a tweet to at mys underscore world. You can do so in the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord or call our mysterious feedback line at 619-738-4515. That's 619-738-4515. And want to encourage you, if you haven't yet, uh, do go by uh, my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken where we have Mysterious World episodes, including this one, in video format. Uh, so there's extra added value from the video. And while you're there, um, please do uh, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell notifications so that you'll get a notification uh, whenever we have a new video out, whether it's Mysterious World or something else. And I do do other videos. Um, it'll also tell YouTube, hey, this, this channel's getting popular. We should show it to more people. <laughs> So um, it'll be a form of evangelization. So uh, please do subscribe and hit the bell notification. And thank you very much. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussions on our website at sqpn.com. And you can find the show notes from this episode at mysterious.fm slash 236A. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. Howdy, folks. This is Jimmy Aiken with a special message as we approach the Christmas season. This past year, the StarQuest Network has continued to expand our mission of exploring the intersection of faith and pop culture through our many entertaining and informative programs. Here on Mysterious World, we've continued to expand our video audience on YouTube with shows that provide extra content and context for our discussion of the mysteries, as well as more interviews with experts and bonus content that goes beyond our weekly episodes. We want to continue improving the show and keep reaching even more people while providing you with the fascinating mysteries that you enjoy every week. That's why it's very important that we hear from you this Advent and Christmas, the time when nonprofits receive most of their support for the year. If you're already a supporter of StarQuest, we thank you and ask you to prayerfully consider increasing your support at this time. If you're not yet a supporter, please become one now. Every gift counts. Could you give $15 a month or even just $10 a month? Whatever level of support you can offer, please show your support for StarQuest this Christmas. And remember that your gifts are tax deductible. Just go to sqpn.com slash give. That's sqpn.com slash give. May God bless you this Advent, and may you have a blessed Christmas season. Thank you.